Schrodinger's equation is to quantum mechanics what Newton's second law, f equals ma, is to classical mechanics. In classical mechanics, we can obtain the trajectory of an object by solving force equals mass times acceleration, where we represent acceleration as the second derivative of position. Now, solving this differential equation for position, x of t, that can provide us with the one-dimensional motion of an object as a function of time. But in quantum mechanics, determining the behavior of a particle is expectedly more difficult, comparing the complexity of the Schrodinger equation to Newton's second law. Introduce the technique known as separation of variables. The method involves an initial assumption that the solution to the Schrodinger equation be a function that is decomposed into the product of spatial and temporal functions. When we plug our onsets into the Schrodinger's equation, partial differentials on each side of the equation become total differentials, which is the first simplification. Next, we can divide by the product psi phi, which gives us the following form of our differential equation. The key jump here arises from the fact that we have two ordinary differential equations. One is dependent only on time, and the other only on space. As such, we can set both of them equal to a constant, which we'll call E, and this will represent the energy eigenvalues of stationary states. How can we do this? Why are they equal to a constant? Take two functions. One, a function of x, represented by the horizontal axis. The other, a function of y, given by the vertical axis. These are two independent variables. Also, consider three points, x sub 1, x sub 2, and y sub 1. In this example, we'll take the value returned by f at x sub 1 to equal the value of g at y sub 1. Specifically, let's say that f of x sub 1 returns 1, and f of x sub 2 returns 3. Now since we said that g of y sub 1 be equal to f at x sub 1, it must be the case that g of y sub 1 must also return 1. Notice, however, that f at x sub 2 does not equal g at y sub 1. And so, f for all of x and g for all of y cannot be equal so long as the functions vary. When we have two ordinary differential equations, one dependent only on time, the other only dependent on x. We can then do the same procedure and say that since one is dependent on a specific independent variable and another on a different independent variable, these two must be equal to a constant. Now, let's solve the time-dependent differential equation. The first step is to rearrange. In this case, we get the infinitesimal increment of time on the right-hand side, and likewise the increment of phi on the left-hand side. Hopefully, you recognize the approach to obtaining a solution here, and that is to simply integrate to obtain phi as a function of t. Recall that the integral of 1 over phi will give us the natural log of the absolute value of phi, and the integral of dt simply will provide us with t. We can solve for phi by exponentiating, and with a bit of simplification, such as renaming the exponentiated constant of integration c as the multiplicative factor a, and also renaming e over h bar as omega, the frequency, we get a tidy complex inverse exponential. Using Euler's formula, we can rewrite this out explicitly using trigonometric functions. This equation provides us with the time evolution of the Schrodinger equation. The general form of the solution of the time-dependent Schrodinger equation is given as the product of this complex time dependence and a spatial function. The spatial function, lowercase i of x, 
is determined by the potential. Now that summarizes separation of variables. Ultimately, this is a very simple and straightforward tool that can allow us to solve the Schrodinger equation in this specific case. It is one which one should be familiar with, especially as they move forward into the rest of quantum mechanics and they learn about separation of variables in the particular context to solve the hydrogen atom potential.